I think at this point when it comes to my YouTube channel, I've done a pretty good job at establishing that cartoons aren't just for kids. Or, at least, that a lot of the stuff that people think are for kids has a lot more frightening and scary stuff than people might know of or at least remember. And while we recently talked about a childhood movie of mine that had some of those elements, and a mature story that spoke to an emotional level, there's another movie that I'm wanting to talk about that is probably among the most frightening thing when it comes to offering kids a movie that can seem all wonderful and happy, only to throw in the most horrifying events at them. That movie is about the appliance that can, the brave little toaster. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am your ever-friendly Pokoprof, and welcome back to Fascinating Fiction. So, I'm honestly curious how many people have actually seen this movie in their childhoods, probably something that their poor mother had turned on because she thought it was a cute film for her kiddos to watch, and not realize the horrors that were inside it. Unlike American Tale, whose darker moments usually had some form of connection to the character's emotions, a lot of the darker moments in The Brave Little Toaster play out more as events for the characters to go through. This is all very disarming when the opening 10 minutes of the film has these appliances dancing and cleaning around our house to the song Tutti Frutti. In fact, I think that's probably the best way to describe this movie. Disarming. Between the front and back cover of its DVD, and the general feel of things in these first few minutes, it's easy to think that this is just simple kid's flair. The first real warning that I think many parents would actually get would be the scene that involves one of the main characters, Blanky the Electric Blanket, basically having a fantasy that their beloved master has returned. I say fantasy in that fashion because when you look at the colors that are used in the scene and the way the character's eyes are designed, you can tell that this is more of a hallucination brought on by a desperate desire. Of course, this is about as subtle as the movie gets as we move on to the scene with the air conditioner, who's already a bit on the creepy side with his introduction. <laughs> Already antagonistic to the rest of the cast, he is the first real scare of the film for most audiences. Not by the way he acts, but what happens to him. Being an air conditioner stuck in the wall, and thus not used by the master like the rest of our main characters, he gets so angry when he's taunted about this that he literally short circuits and dies. Yes? I say he dies, even though he gets fixed in the end of the film. This is because the movie will flat out abuse the idea that the appliances are just that. Appliances. They can be repaired, fixed, or even survive in an extremely broken state. All of which are shown in this film. Now, this isn't exactly the worst thing that can happen when it comes to a kid's movie thus far, right? I mean, outside of a high-as-heck blanket and the conditioner, the movie actually doesn't go too wild and is more of what you would expect from a casual kid cartoon outside of some really catchy songs. But after we get to the rather poignant flower scene about 20 minutes later, something I'll come back to when we talk about the background for this film, we then get the double whammy when it comes to horror, the toaster's nightmare, and the lamp's sacrifice. The nightmare at this point is perhaps the most famous scene out of the entire film, and probably mostly for the creepy clown fireman that we get smack dab in the middle of it. When you mix in chlorophobia with just the overall frightening setting that is the nightmare, I can see why it made such an impact on people, but I honestly found it tamer considering it's put right next to the lamp scene. Because I'm sorry, for me? Nothing freaked me out more than seeing the lamp get struck by lightning, his bulb shattering, and then seeing the entire freaking scene fade to black with what looked to be the apparent glowing corpse of the lamp. At the very least with the air conditioner, his explosion was off screen and we only got to see what was left over. Here we see the entire dang thing. Not every horror scene this movie has is so action-packed, though. The next big one that we get is actually fairly quiet as, after going down a waterfall, we end up with the characters having to pull Kirby, the vacuum, through a boggy marsh and he eventually gets stuck in the swamp itself. Being so heavy, he sinks to the bottom. 
and the rest of the characters are pulled under with him. In any other movie, with almost any other group of characters, the idea of being dragged down into the depths is a terrifying thought. The fact that the radio even says that this will be his last broadcast after he's pulled under simply adds to the terrifying nature of it all. It's only by their virtue of being appliances, the fact that I mentioned before, as well as a scavenger finding the radio before he's completely pulled under, that saves them. It's really this next scene, though, that is one of the biggest horror elements of the entire film, barring the movie's finale. The scavenger that saved them? He is the owner of a junk shop, and uses any of the thrown away or abandoned appliances for parts, selling them to his customers. And we get to see that as he takes apart a blender to sell its motor. What makes this particular scene so impactful is twofold, as we only get to see the characters' reactions to what's happening before them, and hear this constantly haunting music building as the blender is dismantled. Nothing more than shadows are shown on this scene. As my dear mother would often say, the absence of horror is sometimes more terrifying than seeing it before you, since your own imagination can often make things that would far outstrip any film. But it's now that we get to the best part of the film, not only from a horror perspective, but from a musical one as well. With our main cast desperate to escape the scavenger, the junk shop appliances that the man has collected all laugh before breaking into this song. It's like a movie. It's a movie show. More so than anything else in the movie, this song is what gives it the true horror's edge. From the haunting organ that starts the entire thing off, the lyrics mentioning things like Vincent Price, and the fact that the shadows themselves seem to be out to get our main cast give an underlying threat that's impossible to ignore. But what really clinches the entire thing is the ending of the song itself, as the junk shop appliances are pulled skyward into the shadows of the store, their voices slowly but surely rising up. It's then you realize that all these appliances have been insane this entire time, and the inmates are ruling the asylum. Don't think that the scares end here though, as the finale of the movie does a very nice job of bringing in the fright. Worthless, the final song in the film, is a very dark song itself, being about a bunch of cars telling us about what they did before they ended up in the junkyard, often finishing their lines right before they're crushed by a giant compactor. This is a song that a lot of people love, though I feel like it doesn't capture the horror that B-Movie Show does, or is as good. Part of this comes from the song itself, where half of Worthless is simply instrumental background music because the scenes in the movie were about getting the master to the junkyard for the finale. It doesn't flow as well on a repeat listen through. But even with that song not being as strong in my opinion, it's the final bit that really gets you as the master is thrown onto the conveyor belt, leading to the compactor while trying to recover our cast of appliances, trapped and unable to free himself. With the music, the deep red color that the film takes, and the master screaming his lungs out, it's a chilling scene. But you want to know the really interesting bit about all these scares, about the horror in this film? Most, if not all of them, appear in the book. That's right, The Brave Little Toaster was a novella written back in 1980 by Thomas Jisk, who had written it for children, and a lot of what you see in the movie is actually straight out from its pages. Remember that flower I'd say we get back to? That entire bit is almost scene for scene straight from the book. And while there are a lot of differences as it is an adaptation, the amount of things that they actually pull from the book are surprisingly faithful. The horror doesn't stop there though. Creating this film was a nightmare in and of itself. While I've gotten different sources that say slightly different things on this front, the movie itself got started with John Lasseter pitching it to Disney way back when, with the intent on it being a CGI animated film. 
The idea was initially turned down because CGI wouldn't be any cheaper to produce at the time. Lasseter was actually fired from Disney shortly after this because apparently he had gone and upset some of his superiors by going over their heads with the pitch, though it's currently unclear if this was because of the toaster movie itself or the Where the Wild Things short film he was working on at the time. That said, if you're familiar with Lasseter's name, you know that he eventually went on to create Pixar, and in particular, the movie Toy Story, which just so happens to evolve a bunch of normally inanimate objects coming to life when their owner isn't around, and then going above and beyond to reunite with them. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? While I'm not actually certain if that's actual proof that Toy Story was inspired by the Brave Little Toaster, the actual similarities are frankly too strong to ignore. I hopefully have made it clear at this point just what kind of scares and horror this movie honestly has, ignoring its colorful box art and the cheerful kid-friendly tone that it has at the beginning. Brave Little Toaster doesn't pull its punches. But this is just personally what I found that was frightening in this film. Is there a particular moment in the movie that got you as a kid? Or is there another film that you feel does the same thing, luring you in with something that's all cartoony before punching you hard with terror? I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. With all that said, I hope I've done a good job to entertain you and I'll do my best to do so again in the future. Hopefully you'll follow along with my content by subscribing and doing all those other things that gives us YouTubers life. But until next time, stay frosty. Mm -hmm.